All right, so Zoom tells me the participants can now see my screen. Michael, can you confirm that for me? That's correct, Steve, we can all see. Okay, great. So this is in a way part my family story and hopefully um, has some experience that you might learn from, might, uh, might help you out, might save you some trouble. So many of us come up with the idea, let's buy some land and start a farm. Sounds like a good plan. My family and I decided to do that about, uh, about nine years ago now. So this is brought to you by me and my wife and my children and some of their wives. And uh, my main partner in the farm right now is my daughter, Felicity. She is 16. You'll see some pictures of her. She's out milking right now in the rain uh, while I'm here giving the presentation. She said, Dad, I heard you develop it. I don't need to listen to it again. So right there on the front, that was one of our milk cows for a while. Uh, Hope, she was a carry, like it, like to call her the combination milking mowing machine. And there's my daughter, Felicity, uh, a few years ago in the upper right, and then there in the lower left, that's her th about now. And that's the same cow, that's Snowflake. She was our second cow, and she's out being milked right now. And so when we talk about farming, first we're going to talk about understanding the land. All the different things about the land that you might need to know if you are looking to go out and buy some land and start some farms. So we'll hit zoning and water and soil and access and neighbors and a few other things. And then we'll talk about how to plan a farm, about what it is that you're trying to do on the farm and give you some things to think about along the way. Now, when we talk about this, I'm gonna show you all of my farms. I'm gonna use my actual information um, as an example, and you might say, well, you're giving a lot of information away about yourself. The truth is I'm not. Because if you know my name and the county I live in, which you can get from my Facebook page, everything I'm about to show you is a public record. It can be found on the internet with a very quick search. Um, and I used to teach this and I'd tell the cadets, it's a great tool for stalking, but I really didn't tell you that officially. It's really amazing about how much information is available about us. So the first thing we want to talk about is zoning. And one of the best tools you can use is your county's geographic information system, or GIS. And to find it, if you don't know where it is, go to your favorite search engine and type in whatever the name of your county is, blank county GIS, and it will come up. If you've never used GIS before, don't worry about it. It is so intuitive. It is incredibly simple to use, and it can give you some great information about the things that are here on the board. Zoning, boundaries, the unofficial floodplain, I'm gonna show you how to get the official one, the values of the land, a bunch of information about the house, tax parcels, IDs, all those kind of things you need to know to see if the land is suitable for use as a farm. So if you go to Rockbridge County GIS, which is where I live, and you type in my name or click on my farm property, this is what is going to come up. So let me get my pointer here. All right, so that's my property right there. That's our farm. And if you type that in or click on any point on the map, you're gonna be able to see this. So if you know an address, if you know a location, you can find out about the farm. And so what that's gonna tell you Hold on here. Let me change this. Yeah, we'll do it that way. All right, so that tells you who the owner is right there. That's my wife and I. It will tell you the improvements and the land value. So it will tell you what the county says that piece of property is worth as of the last county assessment. It's going to tell you the zoning. So we're zoned A2. And it's going to give you the acreage right there. We're at 88 acres. And then something that's really useful here is the property card. All right, so every county is going to do this a little bit differently. But in our county, the property card comes up right here. So this has all of the information about the house and the property. It's going to tell you, uh, let's see, it'll tell you all about the house. So what it's made of, the year it was built, it will tell you how the county assesses that value and it accounts for the age and it'll tell you what the total value of the house is. So my county, the county says the house here is worth $180,000 and change. 
it'll tell you about the outbuildings, what they're worth, and it will tell you about the land. Now, if you can see that, it tells you that there's 50 acres of wooded land and the picture doesn't look like that. Well, in this case, it's not accurate. It's not always accurate, but there's a lot of good information that you can find there. You can also find the zoning. Right? And here's why zoning is really important. And everybody hates zoning until they're protected by it. Right? Zoning says what you are allowed in your county to do. And every county is different. So it's not the same as where you came from. You've got to account for it in, in the county that you're going to where you are buying the land. So in Rockbridge County, hold on one second here, clear. All right, so in Rockbridge County, any of the things it listed on the list are a by right use in an agricultural district. So I can have a farm. I can also have a confined animal feeding facility and our county has a definition for that. I could put up a school. I can have a single family dwelling. I can't have an apartment building. I can have a church. I can have a cottage industry and we have a definition for that. And nobody can tell me I can't do these things. And so that's pretty important. Not every bit of land is zoned agricultural. In our county, we have something that's called ag transition. And it doesn't let you do the same things as agricultural zoning does. We have some areas that are zoned residential. They're in the middle of the county. They're out in the country. You would swear they were agricultural, but they're not. They're zoned residential and don't have a cow there. You're not allowed to have a cow there. So one of the things you need to look at if you're going to buy a farm is the zoning. Can I do what it is I want to do on that land in my county? So you check the zoning and it's agriculture and it's all good. So then we got to look at covenants and deed restrictions. Because even though your land is zoned by the county A2, there may be something in the deed, a covenant or a restriction, or in the homeowners association associated with that area. And you'd be surprised how many places out in the county have to have homeowners associations to take care of private roads. But that covenant or that deed might tell you no pigs, no cows, no commercial chickens operations, but you can have a thousand horses if you want. And this is crazy. I didn't know about this till we moved to Rockbridge County and we started looking at it and we thought, oh, this would be a great farm. And then there was a little thing on the realtor's notes that said deed restrictions. I'm like, oh, what's that? No pigs, no cows, no what? It's like, what? It's 70 acres in the country. What are you going to do with it? Well, you're not going to have pigs or cows or or, or confined animal feeding operations. On it. So those can sneak up on you if you're not careful. Uh, you really have to be diligent and make sure you look at those. So you got to check and make sure the land is good with the county and that there's no restrictions in the land. Now we're going to talk about the 100 year flood plain. Something that's near and dear to my heart as an engineer. Most folks really don't understand what this means. They don't understand the terminology and they don't understand the impact it has on their land. The technical term currently is special flood hazard area. It's known as the 100 year floodplain because the engineering term is you have a 1% annual exceedance probability. Well, that's a one in 100 chance, right? Yeah, so that's why they call it the 100 year floodplain. Yeah, but it doesn't work that way. It doesn't flood once every 100 years. It says, well, in any randomly selected 100 year period, you're probably going to see this flood once or twice or three times, but you probably won't see one bigger than this. However, that doesn't mean if you haven't had the flood for 99 years, you're going to have it in the 100th. And it doesn't mean if you have it in year 23, that you're not going to have it again until the next 100 years. And as you go along in time, the pro if you look at larger time windows, the probability that you're going to see that flood increases. So within 30 years, the cumulative probability of seeing the 100-year flood is 33%. Right? So that's Russian roulette with two bullets in the chamber. 
And yep, I'm a little that I'm that drastic because when that flood shows up and hits your house, that's what's going to happen. Now, the reason I picked 30 years is that's the length of the average mortgage. You don't have to have flood insurance if your house is in a floodplain. But you do have to have flood insurance if you have a federally backed mortgage, which almost every mortgage currently is. So that's it's the mortgage that requires you to have the flood insurance. Now, in 100 years, the cumulative probability of that event occurring is only 63%. So it's not 100% in 100 years. It's 63%. It's just fancy math. Trust me on it or go look it up on Wikipedia. Um, and, I, and I use the 100 year time frame because, you know, that's kind of the maximum extent of most of our lives. So if you select an area that has a floodplain and you live 100 years, better than average, you're going to see that flood. And as FEMA will remind you, only flood insurance covers floods. Your regular homeowner's insurance will not cover this. So you have to know whether or not your house is, or the property is in a hundred year floodplain. So it may include a house, it may include other structures. And this designation a lot of times will impact the counties in terms of what type of structures you're allowed to build in the hundred year floodplain. Now, here in Virginia, our floodplains are, tend to be narrow because of the terrain. But when I lived in Kansas, you could be two miles from the river and actually be in the floodplain because it was so flat. So here's how to find the actual floodplain. Now, it's a government website, so it changes periodically. They keep changing the names and how you access it, but it generally works something like this. If you type in FEMA Map Service Center or FEMA floodplain or something like that in the search engine, you'll find it. And you'll get a sheet that looks something like this. So put in your address. You put in the address and hit search, and then you'll get a map. So there's where my house is. You know my address. That's where it is. You can find it. Uh, it's not hard to locate. So again, I'm not giving away any secrets. And then you hit the interactive map. And this is what comes up. We used to get these in paper. They were called firm maps, F-I-R-M. That's flood insurance rate map. But right now you get them online. And so there's where my house is, right, right there. Okay. Now here's flood zone A. Now zone A, and this is really important because you may encounter, the, the zones have different designators. A, A, E, there's another one for the coastal designator. I forget what it is. But if you see a zone A, what that tells you is somebody sitting in an office just pencil whipped that line in there. They just drew that line on the map. Nobody studied it. There's been no analysis. It's just some bureaucrat saying, yeah, I think this is the line. Now, what you have to be aware of is they got to draw that line on a map with a pencil which means they're gonna draw it bigger than it needs to be. And if you come on my piece of property and you stand right there on that side of the floodplain and you go over to the other side of the floodplain as it is drawn, the elevation difference is over 120 feet. Now we all know that's not right. Floods don't flow sideways like that. They're all at the same elevation. So when I bought my house, the mortgage company's like, oh, you're in a floodplain. Like, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. So we went back and forth. And it turns out that I'm not in a floodplain because it's an A zone. Somebody just pencil whipped it. It just my house just happened to drop through it. I had to get what's called a letter of map amendment. And these will show up on the um, on the map service center. So right there's my Loma, letter of map amendment. There's what it looks like. You click on it, and it tells me right here that my structure is not in the floodplain. And that's very, very important when it comes to having to buy flood insurance because flood insurance is not cheap. Now, I do not recommend using this as a get out of jail free card because if your house really and truly is in a floodplain, you need the flood insurance because as the numbers I showed you earlier, the probability of that house flooding is high. And when it is, it tends to be catastrophic Flood insurance is the only way to cover that. Um, if it were me, and as I did here, it's all possible, this is something I would avoid. 
And unless there's another reason uh, that you really want that house and that property in that location, uh, floods are a thing to be avoided. And we do have enough information that uh, it's, it's fairly easy to do that. But this information is very, very important if you go to get a mortgage. Because right? again, the mortgage is what requires you to get flood insurance. So you can look at, at the property before you even go out there and find out if, uh, if you're subject to floodplain. Well, let's talk about soil or dirt. If you call it dirt, you irritate everybody, you irritate the engineers, you irritate the soil scientists, but hey, it's just dirt. The US Geologic Survey has a really good tool uh, called the Web Soil Survey. Just Google up Web Soil Survey, there you go. You click start right there, push the start button. They made this thing wonderfully easy. Put in your address. That's the address for my farm. Once you get there, click on the area of interest. So you just click the four corners and it will tell you the area of interest. And you see it uses the same imagery as the GIS system. So once you start to get familiar with a piece of property, you find a lot about it. And then it comes up, says, this is what you want. You say yes and give it the report. And here's what the report says. So it will tell you the different soil types that are on that property. And I know some of you are sitting there saying, I don't know anything about soil. I don't know how to read this. I don't know what this means. What is this shot tower fine loam stuff anyway? That's okay. You don't have to know. Background to this way, way back when, I think in the 30s and 40s, they sent folks all over the country to determine all these soil types and get their characteristics. They put them in a database and computers came along. We computerized it. Now we can access it. So if you click on 58B right there, which is most of my farm right there in the middle, this information comes up. Okay, so some stuff there doesn't quite make national map symbol. I don't know. Annual precipitation, 29 to 41 inches. Okay, so that tells me how much rain I got. That's pretty easy. Mean annual temperature, 53 to 56 degrees. I think that's pretty normal everywhere. Uh, it doesn't tell you the mins and max. Frost-free days, 144 to 186. Hey, that's kind of interesting where we are because we, we're, we are in Virginia. Everybody knows you don't plant before Mother's Day because we will get a frost in the middle of, April, in the middle of May. And so I don't care how nice April is, do not plant before Mother's Day. In that 144 days right there is the reason. That's like 144 divided by 30. That's less than five months. So our growing season can actually be very short. That's it. That's good information to have. Um, farmland classification. All areas are prime farmland. Well, how about that? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that that's probably pretty good soil. And so you can click on each of those and it will tell you uh, that information. You know, it's also got really good things down here. Um, frequency of flooding, none. Frequency of ponding, none. This information on the soil survey is often more accurate than the, um, than the floodplains and the A zones. Because somebody actually came out and walked this ground to determine this. And so if it tells you that it's not prone to flooding, it's probably not prone to flooding. Also got the soil profile there, you know, seven inches down, we got fine sandy loam and then clay. And you know, it gets pretty far down to hit gravel, about, about 30 some odd inches. And we've actually found that to be pretty much correct. We've dug some deep holes uh, for, for test pits and we typically don't hit gravel until about 30 inches down. So this is very good information to determine whether or not um, your soil in the farm is kind of suitable for what you are. And if you don't know how to read it, once you get the soil survey, take it to your extension agent, your local NRCS office, and hand it to them. Says, I don't know what this is. Because I tell you, if you get the land right across the creek from us, it's all clay on the surface. It is, it, it's terrible. It does not grow stuff. It's beautiful land, but it does not grow stuff. And that's kind of important if you want to start a farm. Now, access. <clears throat> You think, oh, I found this beautiful farm. I can drive my pickup truck to it all the time. Yeah, sure can. But if you're going to order something for a farm, it just might come on a tractor trailer. 
So here's where our house is on Stillhouse Drive. And that's what the road looks like coming up to the driveway. A little one and a third lane of gravel or, you know, barely paved road. The pavement ends right about there where I'm standing taking that picture. And if the tractor trailer actually does get up there, you're going to end up unloading it in the street. And there's no place for that poor tractor trailer to turn around. And if he keeps driving straight, that's what he runs into. Goes to all gravel. And there's a dog leg to the right and a dog leg to the left, and, and lots of bad words are going to be said. Right? So you really do need to think about access as to what is going to come into the farm. You got to think about your neighbors. Now, Rockbridge County is a kind of an interesting place, it's a beautiful place, but we have lots of neighbors that moved to the country thinking they were moving to a country club. And every one of us here has dealt with that phone call. That cow looks cold. Should I call animal control? I've had neighbors, friends who've had animal control come out and check on their sheep and make sure the sheep aren't cold in the snow. My son, Andrew, uh, when we bought the second property, we had it maybe three months. Sheriff's deputy shows up and said, um, sorry, son, but we've had a report that you aren't feeding your cows. And Andrew looks at him, he's about 17, and says, uh, sir, we have 80 acres of grass and they are grass-fed cows. De deputy says, okay, thank you very much. I've dealt with a phone call. See, the animal control officer has me on speed dial now. So, Mr. Hart, we have a report that your waterer is broken. I have automatic waterers in the field. But how's my waterer broken? I looked at it this morning at work. Well. Somebody said your horse was just standing there staring at the waterer. That laughs as well. Yeah, the horse is lazy. You know, she goes over, she drinks. I think I'll stay here for a while. But that's something you have to think about. What do the people around you think? And, and how are they going to react? And it's something you're just going to have to deal with as more and more people move to the country and don't want to farm. And of course, we found this sign. I'm sure you've probably seen it but uh, it's very funny and I've been thinking about buying one, but they cost money and I tend to avoid things that cost money. All right, so that is land. If you've got an interest in a piece of property or you're trying to look for farm properties, that is what you need to look at. You need to look at floodplains. You need to look at zoning. You need to look at covenants. You need to look at access. You need to look at, will this piece of land actually work for a farm and you need to know that before you make an offer on it and before you buy it because it's a terrible thing to do to plop all that money down go through all that trouble only to find out then it's not going to work and one other thing i would recommend that you do and i've i've always done this and i've always found it to be a good idea go into the local county zoning officials or the economic development office it's a little different in each county and tell them, I'm looking at this property. This is what I want to do with this property. Is that allowed? Does that work in the zoning? Because they would much rather talk to you before you buy a piece of property than have to have a conversation after the fact saying you can't have cows because even though this is 80 acres and looks like the country, it's actually zoned residential. Right? So talk to them beforehand and you'll be much better off. All right, so let's talk about planning, about what to plan as the farm. I borrowed a term, call it the design basis farm because I'm an engineer and that sounds like a good engineering thing. I was in the army for a while and everybody always talked about planning. And, and planning really is important. You never actually execute the plan. It never comes out exactly like you planned it, right? But planning is what gives you something to move forward to, something to, what's the objective? And I always joke with my kids, it's like, I know what the farm, I know what I want the farm to look like when I'm dead, All right? So I know what the end state is. When I'm done, this is what it's gonna look like. And if you do that, it really helps you make decisions. Do I wanna buy this or not? Is this gonna work or not? You know, does it help me get to where it is I want to go? So I call it the design basis farm. Um, 
zoning and covenants, we talked about that. What are we allowed to do? That's pretty important. Uh, why do you want to farm? Not everybody farms for the same reasons. And why you want to farm is going to impact what your farm looks like. Uh, again, what do, we, what do we want it to look like when we're done? How do you farm? Because there's lots of different models. And um, what's available? Because right? uh, you may not have as much land as you want, or you may have more land than you want. And, and what's the business model? We'll talk about kind of hit each of those things. Selecting stock. Uh, this is something I didn't know when we first started, you know, knew about a few different kinds of cows. There's a whole lot more kinds of cows than I thought. You want to start a dairy, here's five different milk cows. They've each got different traits. They're each good for different things. If you want a family milk cow, a five-gallon Holstein is probably a bad idea. Carrier or Devon, that's a pretty good idea. If you want to make cheese, you probably want a different kind of cow. Uh, if you want to make butter or cream products, you probably want a different kind of cow. But make sure that you're going to select stock that is consistent with what your end state works and that's going to work on your land. If you're down in Texas, you might not want a Scottish Highland cow. Right? So different things to think about in terms of selecting stock. That stock's got to eat. Feed, forage, or both. Right? So again, and this ties into how much land you have. Um, I have friends that farm up in Canada, and they have to farm entirely differently than the way that we're able to farm here in Virginia. Lived in Kansas. We looked at things entirely different in Kansas than we did in Virginia. And that feed and forage um, can really go for all sorts of different kinds of critters. It, it's not just for cattle and sheep and goats, your chickens and your turkeys can get a lot of their sustenance off of the forage as well if you like to, if you do that while you're making notes i would also commend to you a program called graze 300 it's one of our extension agents here in virginia did it and he did the math for virginia said it's very hard to graze 365 days out of the year but it's not that hard to graze 300 and if you reduce the number of cattle you have you can graze 300 days of the year. You say, how do I make my money since I got fewer cattle? Well, you also have fewer inputs that you have to purchase, right? So it's not about how much money you're making. It's about how much you're keeping. It's about the profit. And he's got all the math worked out for it. And his, his take on it is you can have a very productive beef cow operation by grazing 300 days a year and buying your hay. You have a tractor with a bale spear and a bush hog, that's your only piece of equipment. Let somebody else make the hay. It's cheaper to buy it than it is to, uh, than it is to make it yourself. Now, that may not be true in Western Kansas, but it is true in certain areas here in Virginia. And so it's something good to think about. How much pasture? Well, if you're gonna start a farm, if you're an experienced farmer, you probably already know. If you're gonna start a farm, uh, yeah, I don't know, gotta try something. So we talk about animal units, that's just a thousand pounds of animal, right? So a cow is one animal unit, bigger and smaller. You're able to calculate that. Based on that, you can figure out how much they got to eat a day. There's some spreadsheets that are available to do that. Based on the type of grass you have, you can figure out how much they have. And then they've got animal units per acre. What you're able to do is, so if you've got bluegrass unimproved, you can carry three animal units per acre. That's one way to calculate, do your calculations. Your forages come in at different times of the year, cool season grasses, warm season grasses, stockpiled forages for the summer, stockpiled for the winter, so that you're able to figure out where am I gonna graze people during the year? And you know, got a uh, number of days you can graze over there, number of total sheep days based on acreage. And in my area in Virginia, this is not true everywhere in the country. In our area in Virginia, two acres in the summer, two acres in the winter for each animal unit. So for each cow, I need about four acres. If I have four acres per cow, I can probably carry that cow all the way through the year without having to supplement with a lot of purchased hay. A book I would recommend to you is by a good acquaintance of mine, Carol Icarius. Um, it's covered up so I can't read the small scale livestock farming. There you go. Grass fed approach 
for feeding your livestock. Carol's actually done this. And the nice thing about this book, uh, she actually lays out spreadsheets and tables and calculations and helps you do this. It doesn't hurt that she was a civil engineer too. All right, so we tend to think about problems the same way. Uh, but she's got stories of folks that actually done it, folks that did things well, folks that said, ah, maybe I shouldn't have done it that way. I should have done something different. Uh, very easy to read. And, and it, it's very practical. You get to the end of the book and it says, okay, now I can do something with the information. Um, I, I can actually turn the information in this book into a plan to support my grazing requirements. Fencing, lots of ways to fence. Um, these are some of the early things we did because we didn't have any money. Right? So we seven strand barbed wire fence. We actually put a Virginia rail fence through an area because we had to cut down a bunch of cedar trees and what was I gonna do with them? And now that I cut them down, I may as well make fence with them. Um, depending on what you're trying to keep in, depends on uh, what, what the requirements are. You know, my grandfather ran cattle on three strands of barbed wire forever and a day, but everybody knows that won't hold a goat. Right. You got some electric nets there with the goats. Those are wonderful. Uh, but I do always think that Premier uh, does their filming in the flatlands of the country and not, not here in Virginia where it's a little bit more hilly and rocky. Right. So anything can work. Just got to figure out what's going to work in your area. Everything's got to have water. Lots of ways to do it. Uh, you can use on-surface water. You can haul water. Uh, I would really recommend against hauling water because I had to do that for about three years. It takes an incredible amount of time if you have to do that. It is very labor intensive. Uh, so I would say that is, that is a very last resort. That bottom center picture is of a solar water tank. I have seen those used. I haven't made one or tried it yet, but something you got to think about in the winter. Uh, you can use frost-free waterers. Um, you can use water tubs because it gets really cold here in Virginia on some days, and our animals learn that when we bring the water out, they better drink it fast because it's going to be frozen in 30 minutes. Uh, it can do that in the dead of winter. Now, building plants. You can throw a lot of money at farming. You can throw a whole lot of money at buildings. Um, you can build good stuff. You can build bad stuff. But there's an amazing number of resources that are available. And so there's some search terms up there, different places. But again, they're on the internet and they keep moving. University of Tennessee keeps moving that agricultural plan around. But if you Google UT Ag plans, you'll find it. And there's just an example of what poultry plans they have. You know, small houses, big houses, huge things, little things. And the nice thing about these plans is a lot of them were drawn in the 30s and 40s. They're still valid. And so that, that seven by 11, 25 to 30 layers. Hey, that's a great plan for a backyard flock. It's, it's a wonderful plan and it works really well for that. But if you need a big broiler house, that's there too. And so they've got a huge variety of things to do. Um, head gates right down there. You can go down to your co-op and buy yourself a big old fancy metal head gate. Cost you a lot of money or you can make one. Right? Now, I would not want to run 750 cattle through that wooden head gate although we used to do it. Um, the reason I can say I would not want to do it is I built one. And I built this small catch pen. We used it for about three years, built that head gate and uh, everything else was sort of cut off the farm. The hundred dollars was just the metal and the, and the hinges. Um, it worked. We were able to give our shots. We were able to treat our animals. We did castrations. We did all of it there, uh, but it was, it, it was time consuming. But when you're only dealing with six animals, it's not bad. And if it only costs you $100 to deal with six animals, that's a pretty good deal. We, oops. Come on. There we go. Oops. Now we got a few bit more land, a bit more animals. So we expanded our facility. We spent a little bit of money on a head gate. And most of this facility was built with stuff that was left over from an NRCS contract for some fencing. If you look up the term bud box, uh, you'll get some great ideas for small scale livestock handling facilities. Now, these are built on the same ideas that Temple Grandin has used on large scale facilities, in terms of the cow always wants to return to the group. 
uh, but we've got it set up so that we can get we can get most of our herd in there and uh, work them through the chutes, uh, work them through the head gate, load them onto the trailer, and um, and it works for us. But there are things that are available uh, for small farms or for starting farms that you can get into for just a little bit of money, and um, and be very productive and effective on your farm. You got to think about power. You know, you got to think about first people say, well, well, cause I don't have a tractor. I don't have a tractor with a front end loader. And they say, well, how do you survive without a tractor with a front end loader? So I have to figure out how to do things that I don't need a front end loader for. And that's been a lot of our effort because I don't want to go out and spend the money. I don't have the money to spend on that. So you got to think you can buy small compact tractors. Down on the bottom left, that's a log arch. We bought that, it doesn't cost very much money. And we move logs around with that sucker, me and the boys. It's a little bit hard. We don't go too fast, but we move pretty good sized logs um, and not be in it for a lot of money. Uh, the top center picture, there's some small walk behind tractors with baling equipment. We have some of that equipment. It works. We make a lot of hay that way. It's a lot of effort, but it's cheaper than regular hay equipment. And we, we invested in that because financially that was what was gonna work for us. You gotta think about animal power too. Um, you know, we, we farmed before we had hydraulics. We farmed before we had internal combustion engines uh, and we were able to do it successfully. But um, think about how you can use animals to help with that, right? You can use goats and pigs to help clear land. And once the goats and the pigs tear up a bunch of stuff, it's fairly easy to clear, right? Because a lot of it's gone down. And our electric nets, really helpful for that. Of course, everybody's familiar with chicken tractors, things like that for uh, letting the animals do some of your work. And then finally, viable enterprises. Our, our local extension agent uses this term. Your enterprise needs to be viable, me meaning it, it, it's got to be able to take care of itself. And this is different for, for everybody. If your goal is to raise some backyard chickens and sell some eggs, and at the end of the year, you sold $800 worth of eggs, but you spent $900 on food and housing and chickens and everything, that's minus $100. But if your family ate, ate half a dozen eggs a day for the whole year that you didn't have to buy, that's where your profit is. And that enterprise is viable as long as you got that hundred dollars to support it, right? Because you're getting eggs and not really having to pay for them. Same thing. You want to expand a little bit. You want to have that same operation, but you want to eat those eggs for free. But you sell a few more eggs, and now you spent nine hundred dollars on feed, but you made twelve hundred dollars. Okay, now I got a profit, and that enterprise is viable as well. Um, so viable enterprises really need you to think about what your goals are. You gotta be legal and every place is different in terms of licensing, licensing, inspectioning, labeling, depending on what you're selling. Virginia has some very bad laws in terms of what we're allowed to sell. Pennsylvania and New York actually have some very good laws, which I tease my legislatures about. Um, but you need to understand what those are marketing and access to customers. You gotta understand how you're gonna market. Um, Cause you gotta be able to get it to your customer and then the customer has to be able to get to you. This is a little farmer's market that we started on our farm. It's grown a little bit, um, but it supports not only my farm, uh, but a lot of other farms in the area because I happen to have access. And, and it's been really good for our community that we've been able to do this and good for a whole lot of farms, including ours. Don't go it alone. You don't have to know everything. The NRCS has been very helpful to me. Sometimes I've gotten money from them because our goals line up. Sometimes I haven't gotten money because there wasn't enough. And sometimes I told them no way because I don't want to go what you're going to go. The Livestock Conservancy, if you have not heard, from, heard of them, uh, they deal with all those strange things. I said, it's all the stuff with horns like I like to raise. Uh, they can really help you fit uh, stock to the land, finding different stocks and breeds that will work in various places in the country if you're looking for something other than a normal uh, commercial operation. 
If you're a veteran, the Farmer Veteran Coalition is an outstanding resource for helping military veterans tap into, uh, tap into uh, farming. And finally, the Cooperative Extension Service, of course, been around forever. I know this is hit or miss everywhere in the country because I have a great extension agent. We are good friends. We help each other out. I call him up. I ask him questions. He's always got answers. I've been trying to stump him for about seven years, and I haven't yet. Uh, he's just incredibly knowledgeable about the most obscure pieces of information. Um, so I, I have had great success with them, and, and I think a lot of that organization, and I would recommend that you get to know your extension agent because uh, most of the ones I've run into are pretty good. And finally, I'll end up with a picture of my daughter Felicity and her cow snowflake again. Um, that's the top center part of our farm. And that view right there is, I, I joke, that's the view from my, my window. That's the view from my, or not my window, my office. Not my office window, just my office. That's, that's where I like to be every day. That is my, milking is, I think, my favorite hour of the day. Uh, we're milking four cows right now. Yeah, that's a lot, but hey, it works for us. Um, but just the time that I get to spend with my daughter and our cows out there on God's green earth, I certainly appreciate. And uh, there's no, nobody bugging me. Nobody wants anything. You can't make it go faster. It's just a wonderful place to be. And if you've ever done it, well, then you, uh, you, you know how that goes. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing here. Thank hey, Michael, you. I hope that all worked. And uh, thank you so much, Steve. That was excellent. I think everybody here learned a lot about what you would might need to do if you're about to buy a farm. Um, I want to encourage everyone while we have Steve here to, if you have any questions on the top of your head, please go ahead and either raise your hand or go ahead and put your question in the chat, and uh, we'd be happy to pose them to Steve while you're here listening. Give him a couple of minutes to let this come in. All right, maybe no questions. I guess that means you did a good job telling everybody what's going on. Um, Steve, thank you so much. Uh, we have to extend our eternal gratitude to you uh, for coming here and speaking. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, HMI, AGA, and Quibira. Uh, uh, there, is, there is a question. Sources for financing. OK. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bad person to ask for that um, because I absolutely refuse to borrow money uh, with the exception of purchasing the land. Um, if, if I don't have the money to do it, I am not going to borrow the money. However, for borrowing the, purchasing the land, uh, and this, again, I did not know this until we went out, we, we bought our first piece of property, and then we bought the second, which is the most of the farm property. And I went around to all the banks in Lexington, a little small town. I was like, will you give me a mortgage for this? And they looked at it and said, no, we don't do farms. We don't do farms. The only place that I could get a loan to do the farm is uh, farm credit. And so the different farm credit agencies are quasi-independent, quasi-together. Uh, but I found them to be exceedingly helpful for all things farm. They will allow you to get, they'll do financing for the land, they'll do construction loans, facility loans, um, and, and livestock loans as well. So farm credit, just find your local farm credit office is a great place to start. The USDA also has loans available. Uh, they have um, beginning farmer loans, uh, loans that are available for different types of facilities, kind of depending on what the what programs are in vogue uh, at the time. And they also have cost share programs that allow you to put in certain management practices on your farm. We, uh, we applied for and got uh, a cost share program that included stream exclusion fencing, cross fencing for rotational grazing, um, and a well and a piping system. Now, the cost share programs with the USDA, the NRCS, are just that. Depending on the program, you'll get 60 to 
of what they say the cost is. Typically, it's about 75%. They'll give you 75% of the cost to do the, the given practice. My family was able to make this work for us because a lot of the, you're allowed to do the labor yourself. You've got to buy the correct material, but you can provide your own labor. And by not charging for our own labor, we we're able to pocket enough money to cover the things we couldn't do, like drill a well. All right. So um, the the NRCS is a good place to talk to. Just be very careful that your goals and their goals align, because they're a government agency and their goal is to put their practice in place. If you share the goals, you can partner, but don't take their money just to take their money. That's a bad plan. There are also um, private nonprofit organizations that can help with, with different things. The uh, Chesapeake Bay Coalition currently in Virginia is working to partner with farmers to do stream exclusion planning and stream exclusion fencing and tree planting. Uh, so just kind of look around in your area as to what's available um, and, and you might be surprised. Thank you, Steve. Looks like we have another question from Maria. She asks, how do you see uh, the future of your kids and family and the farm? Do they want to keep farming? Okay. Um, my daughter, uh, Felicity, does. Everybody else likes it. All of my children are actually living at some someplace on the farm right now. Two of the boys who are married are building houses. Uh, three of them still live with us. The, other, the others live in the farmhouse. So we've divided up bits and pieces of the farm for uh, family subdivisions so that they've got their, their own house and their own land. Uh, but it, it's funny, they've all done things that sort of fit differently within the community. Um, but they're all able to work locally and in many cases work on the land. One of my sons has picked up chair caning and, and so he's recaning chairs. And that's just about going to be his primary occupation right now because he, he loves doing it and it's easy work so he can do that on the farm another one does blacksmith work uh, and some other consulting work uh, and again he can do that as well and my daughter felicity does um, does does most of the planning and the managing and what's nice everybody helps you know when we've got a big project that we've got to do like putting up hay everybody comes out to put up hay and the benefit that all of them all of them get out of this is, you know, when that steer gets slaughtered, about half the steer gets sold and about half the steer goes to feed our family. So uh, they kind of like the eating, so they kind of like living here. Is there any other uh, last minute questions, anyone? That's a good reason to help out. Snake on the plate is a great reason to help out. Yep. I put my email there in the chat room, hbf.farm at yahoo.com. Uh, you can always send me an email. I'll be happy to answer your question. Uh, occasionally I get back and answer my emails, but uh, everything comes with the, everything I do comes with a guarantee. If you want, uh, want to ask another question or want to chat about something, or if you're in Virginia and want to come visit, just let me know. I'd be happy to show you the farm. Well, you heard it here. Steve Hart's guarantee. Email him any questions. The email's there in the chat. And um, feel free to visit, I guess, as well. It's awesome, Steve. Um, right.